Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to Girls on Film. I'm Anna Smith and this episode will be dedicated to the new movie How to Build a Girl, starring Booksmart's Beanie Feldstein and based on the novel by Kathleen Moran. The film has just hit Amazon Prime Video, who are our partners for this episode. So, the interview. Ah, the interview. My first question is, if you had to murder someone evil, how would you do it? Oh, that is an amazing question. What's your worst song? Oh, I don't know. Which that's... is the best Beatle? Well, that's quite what a lot. What would you spend a pound on in a sweet shop? <laughs> Darling, have you ever done Nick an interview before? No. <laughs> I will be honest with you, I've never done an anything before. I'm quite new. I went on a plane today for the first time. Do you know how amazing it is? Loosely inspired by Catelyn's own experiences, How to Build a Girl tells the story of Johanna Morrigan, a working-class Wolverhampton girl in the 90s who transforms herself into a notorious music journalist. Refreshingly honest about teenage girlhood and sexuality, this comical film is directed by Koki Gedroich, who directed the film Women Talking Dirty back in 1999. Koki is also the sister of the beloved TV presenter Mel Gedroich, who has a cameo in the film as one of Johanna's heroes, Charlotte Bronte. We'll hear from Koki shortly, but first, here's my chat with Catelyn. Catelyn, thanks for joining Girls on Film. My absolute pleasure. We've been looking forward to How to Build a Girl for a long time, so we're very excited that it's finally coming out. How excited are you? Oh God, on a scale of 1 to 10, 20, I guess. It's such a privilege to be able to make a film. I think everybody thinks they would like to make a film about their life, possibly in order to get revenge on boys that called them a fat gruffalo when they were 15. But I actually got to do it. I'm so happy. Have you got revenge on those boys? If they recognise themselves in the brutes and yobs that I have depicted in the film, then I will be satisfied. <laughs> well, I guess several people have already asked you who's the best Beatle and what you'd spend a pound on in a sweet shop. Uh, yes, uh, Paul, obviously, and it would probably be uh, Refreshers, which used to be 2p last time I went to the sweet shop. Probably inflation means they're a £1,000 and I can't afford to buy them. <laughs> well, maybe after this great success of your film, you can afford a whole bucket load of Refreshers. Maybe that's what I'll do on the day it comes out. I'll buy myself two Refreshers, one for each side of my mouth. Treat yourself. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed the film. I've got to say it rang true to me because I, too, was writing about music in the 90s. And I just thought the scenes, especially in the magazine office, were tragically very realistic. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, so were you the only girl in the room too? I was, absolutely. At times I was the boss, but do you know what? That didn't stop the sexism, which is interesting. It didn't stop the microaggressions. Well, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, feminism has been amazing over the last 30 years because I suspect that you, like I, back in the 90s when these things were happening to us, just thought, oh, I must have got this wrong. Like, kind of, I should have handled yeah. the situation better or I've walked into a trap here. And of course, over 30 years, we've started to realise, because we're all talking to each other now on social media and coming up with these new phrases, that these are systemic things that happen everywhere. And we can now identify them and call them out. But back in the 90s, you just thought it was your fault. Yeah, it is kind of a relief in a way that we're talking about it more and you go back in things in your mind and you go, oh, wow, yeah, OK, that was really unacceptable. I mean, because I had no feminism to help me at the time, so when I was, the, the scene in the movie is true where, so Johanna, she's 16, uh, she's working for the music press and she feels like she's due a promotion now. She's been working there long enough and she feels that she should be getting more work. And she says, I, I want to talk about promotion. And the editor goes, come and sit on my lap and let's talk about it. And she doesn't know what to do. And she's completely confused for a minute. And then she decides that she's going to go over to him and slam herself down on his lap and just bounce up and down until he loses the circulation in his legs. And she's shouting, I don't know why I've got to sit on your lap when all the men are sitting on chairs, but if that's the way we've got to do it. Um, and that was how I dealt with sexism at the time because the only ammunition that I had in my ammunition belt uh, was to treat these boys like I would treat my brothers at home. And the only way that I could ever win with them was to just bounce up and down on them and hurt them until they let me do what I wanted. It's one of those things like, I think it's a very common trope for women when they're older to go back and go, oh, I'm so embarrassed by my teenage self. Like she was so embarrassing. Like she was such an idiot. Like, oh, I disowned my teenage self. But no, we need to respect and adore our teenage selves because 
the teenage girl that you were then is the mother to who you are now. She went out there brave and alone and without any backup. And the things she did, whether she got them right or wrong, paved the way for you to become who you are now. Like she is your foremother. She is the person who created you. And so I look back now at my 16 year old self and go, not only did I bounce up and down on that editor's lap, I would kick people. There was a guy who was spreading a horrible rumor about me, basically being a slag. Um, and I made him stand up on a chair in front of all the rest of the staff at the magazine I was working at and apologize. Like just say you're a dick. And now I would never have the courage to do that. But at 16, it was like, you're just in there fighting the battle and do whatever comes into your mad head. It's interesting you say now you wouldn't have the courage to do that. I think the film actually gets that across. There's something quite foolhardy about us when we're that age. But yeah, in a great well, way. <laughs> totally. Well, we don't have that many ideas because we don't have that much experience. So you're just running on instinct. You know, you are, you know, I describe myself as basically being a monkey in a hat at that age. And I was, I was just this sort of instinctive mammal with some impressive headgear. Uh, just sort of like with a very limited range of defences and tactics, but they worked. And, you know, I knew what direction I was heading in, which was to get to the age of 45 and not to have to jump up and down on a man's lap in order to get a promotion. Mainly because my pelvic floor is shot now and we would end up very <laughs> soggy. Now, in the film, Johanna is dismissed when she writes an amorous feature about John Kai. And I thought that was a very interesting moment. Do you think this is a double standard and that that kind of writing is criticised more in female writers than male writers? Well, there's a line in the film where her editor says, you just sound like an overexcited teenage girl. And she goes, oh, I am an overexcited teenage girl. And it's, it's interesting, like one of the values that is least respected in the world is teenage girls loving things. Like kind of, you know, I know so many cool bands from the 90s who wanted their fans to all just be cool boys in their 20s who would stand at the back with their arms crossed going, yeah, it's a good chord change. And when they got teenage fans, particularly at the time of Britpop, and there were girls down the front screaming, they were embarrassed by that. They would like slag off those fans in interviews and like kind of go, we don't want those fans. And even at the time, I just found this extraordinary, like how could you ever be in a position where you would reject love, that you would think someone is so lesser, so, so somehow subhuman, this whole trench of girls, that you are dismissing their love. Teenage girls have the best taste. Like who was first into the Beatles? It was teenage girls. We keep asking ourselves over and over again, how could the Beatles be as incredible as they were in this really short period of time to reinvent over and over and take the world with them? And it's because they had the unconditional love and mandate of millions of girls. Like that gives you a power and electricity. You know, I stood on stage doing gigs where, you know, if you come on stage to a standing ovation and people are screaming at you and clapping as they do to me, suddenly you're 50 times funnier. You know, you're so much more emboldened to sort of tell truths or talk about embarrassing things or reveal things about yourself because you've walked into a room where people go, just give me you. And that's what teenage girl fans do. And the fact that we constantly dismiss teenage girl fans horrifies me. Oh, Josh 17's on the 23rd floor, love. Uh, thank you, but no. <laughs> I'm Johanna Morrigan. I have an interview for the job. Hot, young, Gunsling. Fucking hell. All right, there goes a tenner. Andy, you win. Sorry, I didn't think you were real, love. What? I was a 16-year-old girl with you in the soundtrack to Annie. I just thought it was the dicks at NME winding us up. What did you think my writing was good? Well, yeah, it was funny. It made us laugh, but it's not really us. So I go? I guess. Here. Come a long way. Have a free T-shirt. When did you first realise that your work was striking such a chord with young women? Uh, about six... No, it probably wasn't even that. It was probably about four weeks after How To Be A Woman came out. An American journalist came over to interview me. I sort of took her around for a day out because it was a big magazine feature. First of all, I took her to the National Gallery, where there was a portrait of me in the National Gallery. And... I remember standing in front of it because I hadn't seen it before going, this is weird. And then we went to the Groucho Club, private members called the Groucho Club, and we sat down to do the interview. And we were talking for five minutes. And when I turned around, there was a queue of about 30 women queuing up to just come and say, I love your book. Thank you so much. I love you. And as the evening went on, the entire smoking terrace became full of women just coming to just say thank you. And they all said the same thing. It was all, you made me feel normal. I have felt these things, but you have put them in words. Like, you have saved me time. You have pointed things out. You have shown me solutions. And that's the main thing that I want to do, is to be useful. 
I was home educated and everything I learned was from books and from movies and from TV. And I know that if you get the right book, that that writer will have put everything they know in it so that when you read it, you absorb their lifetime experiences alongside your own. So suddenly it's like you've lived two lives. And then if you get a third book that's as good as that, then it's like you've lived three lives. And, you know, this is how art gives us power. And so that was the game I always wanted to be involved in. I didn't want to be impressive. I didn't want to be showy. I didn't really want to write anything beautiful, you know, although you always hope to. I just wanted to be useful. I think that's the most underrated aspect of art. It's utilitarian value. And I presume that puts a smile on your face when you wake up in the morning, just knowing that you've made a difference to people, right? Well, it allows me to become more useful because once you get an audience going, yeah, it's okay to talk about masturbation or, you know, how you love to comb your pubic hair with your fingers whilst lying in a hammock or the weird crushes you've had on Chevy Chase or to talk about your abortion. That was the first time I think anybody had written about their abortion. And I just had so many women coming up to me going, thank you for telling me that it's an option not to feel bad about this. Everything else that had been written about abortion before was kind of like, you know, I'm still haunted by it. You know, I remember the day that it happened. And some people will feel like that. But a lot of women are like, no, you know, I did it. It was the good and useful thing for me. I know what a huge job it is to be a mother. And I was not up to that. And I'm so glad that I live in a century where I can opt out of it. So so once you've had those things accepted by an audience, you're given a mandate. You're like, OK, I can go further. Let's go and find some more taboos. Let's go find another dark area where people don't shine lights and let's go and let's go and explore over there. Like, thank you for your support. I will now go off into the jungle and find you more things. Was there anything with how to build a girl in bringing it to the screen that presented a challenge? Because there is a sanitary towel scene, which is very funny and very embarrassing. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I was so I know so many women who've had difficult experiences in making film or TV and sort of feel they've been constricted or they weren't allowed to do things. But I was so lucky. I had three incredibly strong female producers and a female director who sheltered me from anything that might have been going on and just went write whatever you want go there do it like kind of you know we will we are with you all the way so there was literally nothing that I wanted to write about that I got a note for the note was always keep going do more where else you want to go let's do this we've been given the amazing opportunity to make a movie and we've got all these stars involved now we've got this incredible cast and crew let's just do it let's compile a list of all the things we wanted to see in a movie and just put it all in here in 90 minutes and let's talk a bit about Beanie Feldstein because she's fantastic but she's not necessarily the first person you'd have thought of. Oh, Beanie's, <laughs> Beanie's incredible so she is already at this stage in her career not just just an actress but she's a thing like I went to an early screening of Booksmart in London and when she walks in the room women go crackers because to my knowledge she is the first woman to come along who is amazing at her job and brilliant and charismatic and funny and amazing and looks like she does that hasn't got a backstory of having been punished or crushed or having massive insecurities like we tend by the time women tend to get prominence they have been a bit damaged and like i love and honor that and we must talk about that but it's also good for the female soul to see one girl who's just been rewarded for her brilliance and isn't damaged. We need to see more girls like that. So I think people really relate to her on like a visceral level. And she, we tried to find a British actress, but I, what I hadn't realized when I was writing the script is that I'd written something that was virtually uncastable because you've got to find a girl who can play 16, who's big, who can start off funny and clever, is in every scene, goes through this massive transformation of turning into this huge flamboyant bitch and comes out the other side that you love her all the way through it, the quantity of dialogue it's very fast it's very wordy it's very ornate how are you going to find someone who can do that and thankfully it takes so long to make a movie by the time between starting the script and ending it Beanie Feldstein had had time to be born to have this huge career on Broadway to have all this experience and to come to us absolutely ready to play this role in which she dominates every scene how did she respond to all the fantastically British detail because it still feels very authentically British Oh, she was so delightfully, I mean, we couldn't come from more different backgrounds. She's like a kind of Jewish LA princess from a big showbiz background. She's now in a relationship with one of our female producers. Uh, she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't take drugs. And she was playing this swaggeringly heterosexual working class girl who drank and smoked for England. But that's the brilliance of an actor. And like when we were worried about her being able to do the accent, she was like, let's be honest, for any British actor, a Wolverhampton accent's really difficult. You know, I watch Peaky Blinders. You know, I know how difficult British actors find that accent. And because she was American, she was willing to go and live in Wolverhampton for two weeks and uh, research the accent, which we totally took advantage of because no British actor would go and live in Wolverhampton for two weeks because they know <laughs> what it's like. Whereas she was like, oh, it sounds cute, I'll go. Went there, made loads of friends, 
and now apparently still gets emails when restaurants in Wolverhampton are doing meal deals and stuff going come and have a half price curry and she's like well, I'm in LA it's going to be a bit of a bit of a trip brilliant now there's some wonderful moments in the script of her writing is any of it directly from your younger self uh I didn't put in, I, I feel like I should have put in the worst review that I ever gave, but we didn't have space for it because it was so long, but it was this huge, uh, the conceit was that the band Ned's Atomic Dustbin had all died and that I was the priest at their funeral and I was giving the eulogy explaining how terrible and shit they had been and how they'd ruined people's lives with their terrible music as I threw clods of earth onto the lead singer's dead face. <laughs> that was the high point of my ass hattery. And when that review was published, my husband, the man who's now my husband, just came up to me and went... Oh, that was a bit much and that was the first time I'd had a critique of my sort of newly cynical writing style and I just suddenly thought yeah I don't want to do this especially as I was getting letters from rock stars mums who had made cry sort of going you've made my son cry and I had this massive revelation like they're just trying to make music and I am treating them like war criminals like why am I they're just boys from what you know from the midlands like me just trying to make their way in the world and make some songs people like and I am literally treating them as if they have a fascist regime this is not me uh you know I love I love the musical Annie I'm a cheerful lady I'm going to be a cheerful lady from now on do you think that there's still a lot of journalism which is a little bit attention seeking let's say and overly critical in order to get that attention yeah, and, and it's even more difficult now because there's so few paid jobs in journalism. And also if you're starting out, like I had, the, I was the last generation that had the luxury of being able to be paid to learn how to write. So, you know, from the age of 16, I was being paid for everything that I wrote. Whereas now you will be blogging probably and you'll not be being paid for it. So there's an immediate class barrier there. If you're having to work a day job before you go and write your blog for free, you will have less time to develop as a writer. Whereas if you've got middle class parents who can support you, you know, you will soar ahead in your career. So that's a, you know, a terrible disadvantage. And with writing, I know this from my years of being a critic, it's so much easier to be all hot, take and sassy. Like, you know, slagging someone off is so easy. It's such an easy joke. It's so much harder. And this is what I try and do in my writing all the time. It's so much harder to write something that is positive or is just boggling. That's as far as I'll go towards negativity. Like, how did this happen? Why is Kanye doing this? What's going on with Kim Kardashian's bum? And to still be funny, but to not be negative. And, you know, I, I think we need that as a species. Like, we need to not associate being funny with being evil because humour is the best vehicle for spreading information. If I am trying to write about feminism or Black Lives Matter or, like, whatever it is, any of the things I believe in and I want to be useful about, I will try to make it as funny and warm and approachable as possible because it's more likely that that message will spread than if you're just sitting there going... Rah, 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 rah. And your message will presumably spread quite well on Amazon Prime now that the film is coming out that way. Do you think that there are some real benefits to having it available widely at home to young girls in particular? I always wanted it to be streamed and we'd got an amazing premiere planned and obviously it would have been a you know, fantastic thrill and honour to walk past the cinema and see that it was on there. But I'd always wanted it to be streamed because... The audience probably that are going to go for this is either going to be women of my age wanting to watch it as a sort of nostalgic trip through being a teenager in the 90s or teenagers who want to watch a movie about a teenage girl. And also I noticed teenagers of this generation are obsessed with the 90s. They're kind of like, oh, you're raves. You could smoke indoors and like no one was problematic. That seemed fun. <laughs> uh, and for both those audiences, it's going to the cinema is a physical barrier. Like kind of, you know, if you're a middle-aged woman, you've got to find a babysitter. Like kind of, you know, you've got to plan the day, you've got to go out. Blah, blah, blah. And if you're a teenage girl, that's, you know, if you're poor, you're just not going to see it while it's on in the cinema. So being able to sit at home and watch it on a screen and watch it with some friends and talk to friends about it when it comes out just to me seems like so much more of an instinctive way to watch a movie than going to a cinema and lockdown hey is the perfect excuse we could do with a laugh and like you know i tried to when i was sort of told that i could make a movie i just wanted to write a list of all the things that i'd never seen in a movie and i had all my messages and sort of like you know topics that i wanted to do but i also just wanted to make it the most fun that's why there's a wall full of johanna's heroes that are like you know joe march and sylvia plath and elizabeth taylor played by lily allen and sharon horgan and melon sue and, and michael sheen's in there playing sigmund freud it's like just make it fun. Have her at a crisis point. Have Björk come out of the poster and give her some advice whilst slagging off Jack Kerouac's On the Road because it's quite a tedious book. Like, kind of just put as much fun into it as you can. Yes, have Binny Feldstein stand there in a bin bag uh, bikini shouting at these boys that are twice her age, telling them they're far too cynical and she's too old for this shit anymore and she's going to go out there and reinvent herself as a positive writer. Like, just give people fun. Here, I have everything I need. Elizabeth Taylor, 
the Bronte sisters on a summer. Dr. Sigmund Freud. Hey, Brontes. <laughs> Time, I have the love and wise counsel of my god What wall. a beautiful day! <sighs> I regret to say that despite my best intentions, today has been another miserable one. Well, Missy, I've had plenty of those. There's nothing a little musical number can't cure. How much longer am I going to have to be here? I need something to happen. I want to burn. I want to explode. Oh, I want to have sexual intercourse. Someone who has a car. What's a car? You've mentioned the, the, the wall of inspiration, and it's very interesting, as you say, to contrast that with uh, her view of On the Road, a very long book about a man getting a lift. Um, <laughs> very, very funny. Was it important for you to show her drawing lots of inspiration from the female canon in her idols? Well, I mean, on the list of sort of issues that I wanted to... So there are dozens of coming-of-age movies for teenage girls, but there are several things in them that I was like, I need to see this life in a coming-of-age movie. So they're very rarely about working-class girls. They're never about big girls uh the message for teenage girls in most movies and tv shows is you've got to have your friends like you find your gal pals you know your gang your tribe they're the ones that support and nurture you but what if you're a teenage girl who doesn't have any friends i didn't have any friends when i was a teenage girl like i want to make movies for lonely girls and that's why she has her heroes on the wall they're like her imaginary best friends that's who she's getting advice from i wanted it to be positive about sexuality again so many tropes in movies about girls discovering their sexualities they meet a man who opens the door to their sexuality and explains what sex is and awakens them and i didn't need to be awakened sexually as a teenage girl i had been discovering myself from the age of 13 onwards so and the main one was that when you see the handsome boy entering at the beginning of the film and you're going I know what happens he ends up as a boyfriend that's what this hero's entrance means it's like no you don't always have to end up with a boyfriend at the end of the movie if you're a girl he's going to become her friend like I've never seen that before the idea that men and women can be friends and you don't have to end up with a boyfriend so all of these things shoved into 90 minutes to just give girls out there who've never seen their coming of age story told. Here you go. I've made a few girls. Do you think that things are moving on in terms of representation, in terms of all those wonderful things you've just described being more acceptable and more marketable in film now? Yeah, I mean, it's always been utterly crazy and that's where you realize there's proper prejudice and bigotry and a very small amount of people from a very limited background at the top because obviously there's always been a massive female market because we're 52 percent of the population and you know i can remember various conversations sort of over the years with people going well if you write about this woman's thing then like no men are going to read it and like kind of like so you'll have to rethink it and it's like well that's fine i could write something that only women watch or read and that's 52 percent of the population i'll take that i don't need to keep pleasing the boys they don't need to have it explained to them i don't need to make sure there's a character that they can relate to like i've been watching things that are just written by boys that are about boys my entire life i managed to relate to the ghostbusters even when they were all men men should be able to relate to a, to an entirely female story do us that courtesy you know we've been doing this to you for centuries just like give us half the programming well, that's it. We've all been conditioned to relate to men, so there really is no reason why the reverse shouldn't apply. I've seen Spider-Man's origin story so many times, <laughs> like so many times, but I've never seen a fat working class girl masturbate. There are fat working class girls masturbating all over the world constantly. Do you know how many Spider-Mens there are? None. None Spider-Mens. There is none Spider-Mens. So just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I heard that you are next writing a utopian film. Tell me more. So my feminist glasses get stronger and stronger prescriptions every year. So I was looking at sci-fi and I love Charlie Brooker. I love Black Mirror, but it's always about how technology is going to screw you over. Where all sci-fi is basically about in the future, technology is going to come and bump you. And the reality is that it doesn't. Like we love technology. We're on technology now. When I stop talking to you, I'll go and use some more technology. We love technology. Why aren't there any positive stories about technology? So the next one that I'm working on is, you know, a sci-fi movie about how great technology is. It's very funny. And uh, I'm just sitting and chuckling to myself as I write it. It's, we, we go straight into the issues. We're basically doing how can we talk about the war between the sexes using good technology in the future? Fantastic. Well, will you come back on Girls on Film and tell us about that when it happens? Absolutely. Excellent. And any last message for the Girls on Film listeners? 
I'm going to sing what should be your theme tune to you right now so it can echo around your head like a terrifying ghost. <laughs> Girls on film, we're having a good time. Girls on film, with wanking and singing. Girls on film, this is such a good show. Girls on film, I'm going to stop now. That was fantastic. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed, Kellen. Run. Somewhere Simon Le Bon is lying on the floor and crying. I'm sorry, Simon. <laughs> Thank you for joining Girls on Film. Good luck with the film. My pleasure. Cheers, darling. Welcome to Girls on Film, Koki. Congratulations on the film actually coming out on Amazon Prime so people can watch it very soon. How does that feel? Oh, such a flipping relief. (laughs) I've been doing television for so many years and then making a movie again reminded me of the sort of butt-clenching life. (laughs) <laughs> post-production period where you're waiting and waiting and you know finishing the film and getting it out it's just it feels sometimes like climbing Everest but we're there it touches on so many important points that we feel very passionately about on Girls on Film which is being really authentic and honest about the female experience and also not falling into cliches that you so often see regarding female characters in films what was it about this project that made you excited to tackle for me It was about telling a kind of wild and bombastic coming of age film, but it being about a girl really was a huge pull for me because that was a very, very unusual thing. Two years ago when I came on board and we started on the film, there weren't any, there just weren't. And Catelyn was a kind of trailblazer. And so to have a character who can mess up and have the wrong kind of sex and do silly things and make massive mistakes and not die because of it (laughs) or you know be punished was a really really important thing it's a really funny funny script it was a really funny script I hope it's a really funny film Um, but it also has incredibly important messages tucked in sort of underneath the jokes and it has a kind of internal joy and exuberance about it so that the character isn't punished the character gets up pulls herself back together and carries on, reinvents herself. And I wish I'd seen a film like that when I was 16, to be honest. Well, it does, I think, have the potential to change young lives because it does talk about things that normally are taboo on screen. Were there any challenges for you in bringing some of the more kind of honest moments to the screen? I had a long fight over the sanitary towel. A long battle to get the sanitary towel on screen. (laughs) Oh, you know, because I suppose, you know, there's a fear that that might be not funny or it might be a bit icky and will people understand it? And then there was this thing as well, Anna, that in the edit, you see the film hundreds of times. You see the film again and again and again and again and again. And it's incredibly hard to keep the comedy light and easy and light on its feet because it can get pounded. It can get battered in the process. And that was one, that little sanitary towel was definitely one that needed fighting over. It became a little bit of a mission for me. I started doing yoga, actually, at the beginning of making How to Build a Girl. And it it was really, really hilarious because every morning I'd get on the mat and I'd go, I'm going to win this battle today. This little battle, I'm going to win. And it was helpful. What do you think is important about scenes like that in movies for young people to see? Well, it's important that they are funny. Um, I don't think that they can be kind of gratuitous or slapped in there for a message. I think they have to be properly woven into the narrative. And what was important about that little scene for me is that it's about her. It's about her not fitting in with a bunch of really popular girls who all just look perfect and they all have great skin and they're all great friends. And our character, Johanna, doesn't have friends. She's not your classic, perfect, popular body shaped character she's herself she's absolutely herself and she's unusual and so she's punished for it by them and that's why it's important i know what you're thinking there are a few key differences between me and your typical heroine for starters i am not a tragic orphan i actually have too many brothers which is simply excessive. 
And then there's my mother's postnatal depression, which you should absolutely expect if you get pregnant at 38. Ugh. Unlike Virginia Woolf, I don't even have a room of one's own. This is Chrissy's room, with a partition down the middle, like Berlin. Tell us about your approach to the style of the film. It feels visually quite sort of teenage dreamy. Yes, it is teenage dreamy, but it's very truthful as well. Yeah. It was really important to me that these characters live and breathe and that you feel like they are absolutely recognisable people that you know, people who live down the road, your neighbours, your friends. So I didn't want to kind of heighten any of that or give it a kind of gloss. But on the other hand, I didn't want it to be oh dear, these characters are very poor, so they're going to live in a brown house and it's all going to be really gloomy, which is just rubbish. I went to see Catelyn's home with her in Wolverhampton and we talked about this and she showed me pictures of growing up there and they, she will say it freely, they were very poor and her house was full of books and pictures and stuff stuck on the wall and music was playing. She said there was a ton of laughing and it was so important, it became a bit of a mission for me to kind of put that on film, that kind of heady mix of, of something that is utterly truthful, real, believable, but also full of joy and full of laughs. It is so rare to see that. You're so right, there's this kind of terrible cliche of poor misery and squalor. Talk to me a bit about the casting, not just of Beanie, but her family, because it's a fantastic support cast. Oh, I love them. I absolutely love them. Well, they're all actors who I want to be friends with, basically. I want to hang out with them. I've been a massive fan of Paddy Considine since forever, literally. And he, in my mind, just has that amazing kind of mix of being sort of like a rebel soul. And he's kind of provocative and he's quite odd on screen sometimes. And completely lovable and completely empathetic I don't know he's just really unusual and Sarah Soleimani similarly is not afraid to be an absolute out and out bitch but at the same time has depths of again empathy and sweetness absolutely adorable sweetness to her so that's how I pieced together the family it was like who are you going to believe who's going to be able to swear and be believably you know, annoying or pissed off or, in Sarah's case, switched off. And yet, you're going to care about them. That's that's how we pieced it together. Well chosen, I must say. And it, and it strikes me, I've just recently seen Sarah in Greed as well. And she's incredibly versatile. You say, to, to think that's the same actress. It's amazing. And Beanie, surprising casting choice, but totally works. At what point did you sort of think, oh, this is going to work? Or was it when you hired her? So we watched Lady Bird and we loved it. We loved her and we just saw in her you know the right person she's a movie star she's a brilliant actress she's obviously really funny completely got the comedy bones and she really again I guess it's a bit like how we cast Paddy and Sarah Solomon you know she's someone who you completely kind of connect with and is believably your friend or your pal or someone who lives next door but at the same time she has a huge universal glow around her that is movie star it's an extraordinary thing but she has it so anyway we saw ladybird and then it the moment the kind of eureka moment was when i got on skype with her and she just started talking about it and talking about how important the film is and what an important message it is to young girls and how she wished she'd seen a film like this when she was growing up and she said okay the accent's a bit tricky i get that but bring it on. I'll learn it. I work hard. I'll do it. And so that was my moment of absolute total sureness. And then we did a lot of screen tests with her and financiers were really, really pushing us and questioning us and checking because it's right to, it's right to be really, really sure. Had you seen Booksmart at that point? No. Before. Yeah. So what did you think when you saw The Wonder That Is Booksmart? I loved it. I loved it. It was more super bad than How to Build a Girl. Yeah. You know, but it's, oh, it was such a joy. <laughs> it's a mad, mad roller coaster. And so, so good to see girls behaving like that on screen, frankly. 
exactly. And she seems to be making a habit of it with How to Build a Girl as well. One thing you've touched on is the way it's really about Johanna embracing her body and her sexuality yes. and how liberating that is for her. Can you talk to me more about how you decided to show that on screen in any particular moments in the film, perhaps where you feel that is really demonstrated? In terms of um, body positivity, I think, to be honest, that she is utterly at one with her body shape all the way through. There is never a revelatory moment in the film because she just is happy with it. And what I love about this film is that everyone else is and no one mentions it and it's not a big deal and she just feels freaking gorgeous. And so we just had a ball with, particularly with Stephanie Colley, the costume designer, we had an absolute ball because what we did was we just, we just went, well, what does she feel good in? Who gives a toss what anyone else thinks? What does she feel good in? So we had these hilarious moments where Beanie said, well, if I wear this puffball skirt and I've got my fishnet tights and they come over my tummy, under my bra, wouldn't that be funny? And isn't it great? Doesn't it look brilliant? And so we just go, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Let's have that. And then when she appears in the bikini and the kind of, I hope this isn't a spoiler alert to your listeners, but anyway, she appears in a bikini made of bin bags. Again, Bean said to me, look, don't put me in a nice, pretty color. Don't let's not go pastel colors for this bin bag. You know, let's go translucent white bin bag, kind of hideous. <laughs> slightly pervy <laughs> shows every single crease and you love her for it you love her courage you love her brilliant body positivity and joy about the way she looks and in the family it was so important for me this in the family scenes you know you know that they all love it too that is shockingly rare shockingly wow. rare yeah. never never seen it absolutely it's the most subversive thing in the film i think yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that, yeah. I mean, it's 20 years since you made Women Talking Dirty, which yeah. I enjoyed. Tell me more about how you feel the landscape maybe has changed, if it has, since then, you know, in terms of portrayals of women on screen. Oh, Anna, I'm sorry, it hasn't really. Wow. We're getting there. The dialogue is happening. The debate is happening. This is now something that people can see, at least, and recognise. But, oh, man, it's mortal combat out there and we just have to keep pushing at the door and keep producing good stuff and do it with grace and sense of humour and not take ourselves too seriously. But it's, we're still in the fight, to be honest. What would you advise women coming through in the film industry, specifically directors, to do towards that goal? The way I've done it over the years is I haven't dwelled too long and too hard on the fact that I'm female because frankly I just I'm not that interested in that particular way of defining myself as a director. I don't go on set thinking I'm a female director how am I going to be super female today? You know how's that going to work? What are the stories that I'm going to tell because I'm a female? I mean I just you know let's not be so old-fashioned about it let's just accept that we're human beings and there are good directors and less good directors. And oh, I don't know, this is how I survive it. This is how I have survived it. So I, I don't dwell on it too much. I don't enter the room as a victim. I don't bring my issues with me. I try to have a laugh. I try to not take myself too seriously. I've had countless doors slammed in my face and I just keep banging at them, keep knocking. And if I can't get in that way, then I'm going to chisel away at the hinges or I'm going to sneak in through the letterbox you know any which way and not to be beaten down so if you get rejections just like Johanna stand up reinvent go back in like I love the scene when our Bjork alike <laughs> speaks to her in the loo and says you're cool don't you understand you're the cool one there I'm cool in that room get up wipe your tears away and go back in and honestly, directing that in a film, frankly, is the most feminist thing I can do. Bravo. And to finally ask, uh, we have to ask about your sister, who you've also directed in the film. How yeah. did that come about? I just rang her and said, you've got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
she's so brilliant she's so supportive and she and sue are just in their own way incredible icons and all those brilliant characters on the god wall men and women alike just wanted to do it because it was catlin because they loved the story they loved the kind of the narrative of it they loved what they represented and they did it for free and they just did it for fun Oh, that's amazing. Well, all in a good cause. Thank you so much, Koki, for joining oh, us. Well. And best of luck with How to Build a Girl. Thanks, Anna. Great. Bye. We don't employ little girls to write our newspaper. What? <laughs> to mental girls from council estates. Oh, God, what do I do? You are the unstoppable force. So, don't stop. How to Build a Girl is on Prime Video now. Thanks for listening to Girls on Film and thanks to our executive producer, Heather Archbold of HLA Productions, to our producer, Jane Long, to our intern, Heather Dempsey, and to Amazon Prime Video. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review us and follow us on socials. You can also check out our video shows on the BFI's YouTube channel and pop over to our Patreon page to access extra content and discounts. Go to patreon.com forward slash Girls on Film podcast. Look out for our next episode with Amazon Prime Video, featuring a special interview with the writers of Legally Blonde. I've been Anna Smith, and I was joined by Catlin Moran and Koki Gedroich. Stay safe, everyone. Johanna Morrigan is dead. This, this is the legendary Dolly Wilde.